Well, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. On Sundays, we're starting a brand new teaching series today called Letters. Some of you know this because you've been around throughout this whole year. We're reading a, a New Testament reading plan together as a church, and so everyone who's participating in that knows that we just started the book of Romans, and we're going to be looking at three major letters in the New Testament, Romans, and then 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and they're sort of all clustered together in this series. They call them epistles in the Bible, but they're really just letters. These letters were written to churches. Some of the other letters we'll look at later in the year were written to individuals, and they're all instruction in what it really means to live the Christian life. Now, you and I don't really get, receive, or write letters like this anymore. You know, Romans is like 16 chapters, you know, broken down by verse. I can promise you, if you write me a letter that is broken up chapter and verse, I will not read it, okay? That's just not something that's part of our life anymore. This would be a letter that Paul would have poured over for weeks, probably months, adding to it, probably revising it with drafts and working with a scribe to get it to be just right. And we don't really have these type of letters anymore, but we sure do get a lot of mail, right? Between your mailbox in front of your house and your email box, I mean, we get tons of mail. I mean, what is the most popular kind of mail that you get? Junk mail. Unless it's a postcard from Beacon Church. Then it's a jewel. It's a gem. It's a piece of art, right? But yeah, so many junk mails. How many 0% credit cards does a person need? I get like three offers a week, right? What's your second most popular kind of mail? Bills. This is why we're not so excited about mail anymore, right? Yeah, there, uh, a few weeks ago, my wife was away for like three days. And by the third day, we have the mailbox that's like here on the wall with a little flap, right? On the third day, the mailman left it up because he realized I hadn't touched the mail in three days. Like he was shoving things in there. Although I have found that if they can't fit all the mail, they don't leave the junk. Don't tell anyone who mails out postcards for their church's outreach ministry that. But if your mailbox is full, they don't leave all the junk. But we get so many different kinds of mail. What else? I mean... You get regular bills, you might get a past due bill. That's very different from a regular bill, right? Or, you know, maybe you get an acceptance letter to college. That's very exciting. Or maybe you get the other letter from a college. That's not very exciting. Some people have gotten a breakup letter in the mail or over email or a breakup text. That's the worst. I've, I'm thankful for many things in my life. One of them is that I was long done dating before texting ever became a thing. I'm so glad. You know, but what other kind of mail do you get? You might get, um, you, you do get a personal letter at times, right? A friend wants to check up, see how you've been. Um, you get that letter when somebody in your neighborhood wants to put a new porch on the front of their house, right? They have to send you a certified letter. I mean, there's so many different kinds. Today, we're going to kind of look at one type of card that you might get in the mail, a sympathy card. You know, you receive a sympathy card because things have been tough, Right? And we're going to look at Romans 5 today, where Paul is talking about when times get a little bit tough. Now, any of you get this kind of mail? You get an Amazon mystery box. Does anyone here get the Amazon mystery box? All right, this happens to me sometimes. There will be a box to the house. It is addressed to me from Amazon Fulfillment Services. And I have no idea what's in it, even though I ordered it. Am I the only one that does this? Like, wow, we got a pack. What's in here? And you open it up, and it's like, oh, great. It's the garbage bags from Subscribe and Save. You know, or like, oh, nice. You know, more paper towels. You know, it's the mystery box. What Paul is talking about here in Romans 5 he, is what to do when things are getting a little bit tough. Now, what's cool about Romans 5 is he starts with a two-verse summary of what's come before. For all of chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4, if you've been doing the readings, you know that Paul has really been hammering away on what faith looks like. What is real faith? So here in Romans 5, he takes two verses to sum up three chapters. Now, I know none of you would ever miss any of the readings. I know that none of you would ever fall behind. However, if for some reason Romans 2, 3, and 4 escaped you this week. We'll dig in here for just a minute in Romans 5, two verses. He's going to give you a summary. This is what he says. Therefore, that's the reference back, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. This is that summary. 
We're just going to, I want to talk about these things each just for a brief second, because these are major themes in the book of Romans, and we'll, they'll come back for all of these three weeks that we're in Romans. But just to introduce you to them. First, he said, we are justified through faith. Understanding justification is knowing that this is how you can be forgiven, how you can be declared just. And you are declared just through faith in Christ. And in this chapter, Paul and the, the, really the three before, Paul has talked about some of the other ways people thought they could be declared just. Some people thought they were just because they were born under the law, which means they were born Jewish, and they followed the Jewish covenant lifestyle. They thought, now I will be declared just. Other people have done good works in this world, and they think they're going to be declared just. And Paul said, no, it's none of those reasons. It's through faith in Christ that you're declared just. So justification is the doctrine that God pardons, accepts, and declares a sinner to be just on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Then he goes on, he says, we have peace with God, reconciliation. Now this kind of peace, this is not inner peace, okay? This isn't contentment, this isn't happiness, this isn't ease. This is peace as opposed to war. This is peace like a treaty. There has been peace declared between God and sinners. Romans 5 says that those who have sin in their life who were enemies of God, are now at peace. You say, I was never an enemy of God. The scripture says that sin has separated us from God, and that relationship, that enmity is a good Old Testament word, and that was only reconciled through faith in Christ. And that's how this relationship is restored. Then what do we have? Access into this faith in which we now stand. We have assurance of faith. We have access directly to Jesus. There's no longer anything that stands between God and man. There's no intermediary. You don't have to go through a priest to, ac to access God. You don't have to go through a sacrifice to access God. You don't have to go through any sort of uh, religious holiday or ceremony or routine. You have direct access to God, and that access is sure. It is known. That's one of those kind of interesting questions about Christian thought. Sometimes we'll talk to people who are being prepared for baptism. We'll ask them, do you know that you have a saving faith in Christ? And you know what a lot of people say? They say, well, I, I think so, but I'm not sure. I say, why are you not sure? Well, I mean, one of the major principles of the scripture is humility. And so I just want to be humble, and I want to accept that maybe, you know, there's something. See, this, this is a little bit different. This is an area where you do not need humility. This is an area of great assurance. For those who have faith in Christ, your faith is known, it is assured, and it is not arrogant to say that because your pride is in not what you've done, but it's in what God has done. So to have full strength and confidence in what God has done is not arrogance, it is faith. So yes, you can know that you are saved. You can know that your salvation is is known and secure. Now here's what I love, because Paul just has to state that real quick. Three of the biggest, strongest, you know, most robust doctrines in all the Christian faith in two verses. Bang, bang, there you go. And then he says, now let's talk about what that looks like in life. And he's done talking about faith for several chapters, and now he talks about life. And he's going to unpack it in a couple of different ways. And the first way he's going to unpack it is in this topic, chapter 5, verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. He says we glory in our sufferings. Here's your suffering. We're going to glory in this suffering. Doesn't that sound a little odd? I think it's, it's okay to say this. I think that's exceedingly odd. To say, I'm going to glory in my suffering. So I dug into this word. I thought, surely this glory can't mean rejoice in my suffering. That's exactly what it means. Surely it can't mean I'm going to find joy in my suffering. Well, that's exactly what it means. Paul is saying, when we suffer, we can find glory there. We can rejoice in it. And I think this is weird. Like, is Paul some sort of, like, masochist? Like, he likes pain? I've personally 
try to avoid suffering at almost every, every angle. Anything I can do to avoid suffering. Well, that's, that's going to be hard. I don't want to do that. And Paul's saying, we're going to rejoice in this suffering. And what we start to realize is what happens in suffering is one of the most hopeful messages in understanding the message of the Bible and understanding the gospel. Because it's understanding that in your suffering, God will use it to help you grow into the person that he wants you to be. It's one of the most hopeful messages of the Bible is knowing that your suffering will not be wasted. And many of you already know suffering is coming in life. If you haven't really experienced suffering, you know, be, be very thankful. I, I, I personally mostly feel that way myself, frankly. I haven't really had a lot of suffering in this life. But there's always suffering that touches us. Why? Well, first of all, because of sin. I mean, you will suffer from your own sins. I think we've all experienced that. You do something wrong, something stupid, and you're going to pay the price. Now, it doesn't mean you're separated from God forever, but you still can have great consequences of sin here in this world. You also will suffer from the sins of others. Isn't that a nasty one? Right? Other people sin against you. It is totally their fault, and you will suffer. It's happened. You can think of examples in your own life. You can think of examples in the lives of people you love. Someone sinned against them, and they are suffering. You will also suffer simply because of the general broken condition of the world. This is sickness. This is disease. No, this is accidents. You know, there's so much suffering and pain you know, from cancer. You know, that with most cancers, you didn't do anything to get cancer. It's just part of this broken world that we live in. And that suffering is coming your way. And the Bible teaches that God will use the suffering that is coming your way in order to help you grow into the person that he wants you to be. But it doesn't end there. I actually kind of wish that it did end there. That would be a great end of the sermon in so many ways. I would love it if that was it. When you have to suffer, unfortunately, you're going to have to suffer. But when you do, God is going to use it anyway. But this verse that we're studying takes it further because it talks about suffering as the beginning of a necessary process in order to grow to become the people that he wants us to be. We actually need suffering in order to become the people that he wants us to be. So the text teaches us that suffering leads to perseverance, right? So when these are done properly, they fit one to another, and suffering leads to perseverance. But what if you don't suffer? What if you never really suffer? Have you ever met anyone like this? There are several words for people like this. We're going to go with entitled, okay? People who've never really suffered a day in their life, well, they... The only thing they suffer from is entitlement. And you've met them, and sometimes you have been them. It's easier to see in others, but we can also find it in ourselves. When things come easy, well, we don't really care for them. We don't really look out for them. And we expect them. Entitlement, of course, is more common in the young because they've had fewer chances to suffer just yet. You know, this is why, you know, you'll see... Sometimes a billionaire will say, I don't want to give my child a billion dollars because I think it would ruin their life. This is what they're trying to talk about. You know, and you see this. You see it in the media. You see, it, you see this a lot on Long Island, let's be honest. This sense of entitlement. If you never suffered, this is who you're going to be. And your growth into becoming the person that God wants you to be is done. You have to realize that a sense of entitlement gets you nowhere. That the only cure for entitlement is suffering. Now, I wish that I could just learn from someone else's suffering, right? Like, wow, they are going through it. I'm going to learn that lesson as well. And like, we'll just be done. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work that way. So then, when we start to suffer properly through God's equipping, we start to find perseverance. Perseverance is that attitude that says, I'm going to get through this. You know, I have... That the courage, the strength, the kind of stick to to say, I can get through this. If you don't persevere, then who are you? You're a quitter. You're not going to progress. 
This is where your growth will end. The first time you hit difficulty, the first time you hit suffering, your development stops here. You say, well, this road seems difficult. I don't think I'm up for it. It seems like a lot of work. I don't think I want to go there. Maybe there's an easier way out. I don't want to do the robust thing. I want to take the easy thing. And here is where you get stuck. But instead, with perseverance through the message of Christ. Because fundamental to this, we have to always remember ourselves this question. Does our suffering threaten our justification or our reconciliation or our assurance? Those were givens. Remember, Paul laid them down. This is what you have. One, two, three. Now you're going to suffer. Are any of those things threatened? No. Those are known to you. So now you can start to progress and you can start to grow. So you have suffering. You have perseverance. What comes next? You have character, right? What if you don't get through this with character? There sometimes there are shortcuts that you can take. And it, instead of growing, kind of, you're just a little bit shifty. That's an F, okay? <laughs> just, right? You, you can't really trust these people because they didn't give up. They're just a little too smart for the room. They sort of found an end run. They sort of found an exception, a loophole. And they, they actually kind of look down on you because you put in the work. And instead, they're here. They found a loophole. But their development has ended. They're no longer progressing into the person that Christ wants them to be, right? So instead, we really see this process through. We start to develop real and true and godly character. Now, interestingly... This so far is sort of like regular pop wisdom, okay? You can get this far up the Great Wall of Suffering without the gospel, right? This is every self-help book ever written. When times get hard, work hard, and you'll be a better person over and over, right? There's sections on this in Barnes & Noble. Do you remember Barnes & Noble? <laughs> you know. There's whole categories on this in Amazon. <laughs> the difference is, this is not a fully developed person. And so what happens often is when you climb this ladder to here, the next time you hit suffering, it will hit you worse and in a different way. I love to read a lot about running and fitness in different phases in my life. I do more or less of that. And so that's why I read about it. And what you'll find is that there are a certain type of person that will work hard for a race, they'll do the workouts, they'll eat the right way, they'll finish the race. Six months later, they're in worse health than they ever were to start. They didn't actually progress. And that's because this is all through our own effort, our own strength, our own power. This is what I can muster up. Honestly, I can do this by myself. I can if I work really hard for a season, for a time, in a certain project, I can do this. But there's, if you do only this, there's no gospel, there's no Bible, there's no Jesus in this. Because it's through the person of Christ, that's where we find the real hope that Paul is talking about. Because it's that hope that's found in Christ that completes this growth. the person of Christ, because you all know this is not linear, right? It's linear when you have to preach it in 25 minutes, but in life, it's not, right? It's one, two, back to one, one, two, three, all back to two, three, two, four, we did it, and then we're back to over and over and over, right? This should be a wheel with spokes interconnecting them all, because that's what real life actually looks like, and it's through the, the message of the Bible. Another author, James, he picks it up this way. He says, consider it pure joy. There's the weirdness again. Pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you can be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. How do you do this? If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Some would call it assurance, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. It's the wisdom that comes from God that makes this growth real in your life. 
Peter talks about this as well. He says, in all this, and this is what he's talking about, greatly rejoice. Now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. They have come in to prove the genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This process is necessary in us to become the people that God would want us to be. So I think if you got this in the mail as that sympathy card we were talking about, you could boil it down to maybe these three things. First thing that God would be saying to you in this sympathy card is, I am always with you. You're not alone in this. Christ is equipping you every step of the way. So when you find yourself in a pit of suffering, know that God is there with you. I know there are people here today who really are suffering. I was working on this message when I got this week's prayer request at my desk, and it just hit me. Like, the prayer request lists are longer than I can ever remember. You know, people who need help is more than I can ever remember. I mean, people are hurting. People are hurting financially. People are hurting relationally. There's a lot of health and sickness issues in the congregation. No, God is with you in that. You do not suffer alone. He is with you in the suffering. And the second he tells you, you are going to make it. Now, there's a nice bumper sticker that says, God will never give you more than you can bear. I don't, that's not actually a, a verse in the Bible. But what we know is that this is a process of refinement. And wherever you're in it, God is using it for his glory for his purposes, and we trust him that he is using it in the way that he sees fit. And in that way, we're going to make it. And then the third one would be use this opportunity to grow. Now, hear me out on this. If you got this sympathy card in the mail and something bad was happening in your life, this is the one that would tick you off, right? You're writing me a sympathy card because something terrible happened, and you're telling me essentially, well, you know, make lemonade. That's the message of the gospel, that this suffering that you're experiencing is going to be used in your life. It is going to be used for his glory so that you can grow to become the person that he wants you to be, that he's calling you to be with that faith as pure as gold. Now, about suffering, I want to let you know a couple of things. I was serious when I said there are more people that need prayer than ever before. We're doing a prayer event here tomorrow night called Vespers. Vespers just means evening prayer. Um, we just liked it, so that's what we call it. But the way we're going to do this, and we've done it before, is we're going to have church leaders here available to pray for you, for your needs. So I hope you'll come. I think it's 7.30. You just check, check all the streams where we get all the information out, and you'll know. I hope that you'll come out so that we can pray for you. I also hope that if you're coming here this morning with prayer requests, you'll write them down for us. We do pray for you every week if you put requests on those cards. We take them very seriously. If you see there, we kind of distribute them in two circles. A larger one, which is all great people, and then even a smaller one if your request feels kind of confidential. Please use that. It's a tool that's important to us. And then we also have people available after the service to pray. You know, if you're here today and your heart is just breaking, we have people available for you so that we can pray together. So I want to pray for us now, and then we'll do a couple of other things. God, we're so thankful for the message of your word. Um, we're really not there yet in rejoicing in suffering. But God, we see your wisdom in it. We see that you use suffering for your glory to teach us how to be the people you want us to be. God, I want to pray specifically and personally for those who are suffering here in this room this morning. God, I even just look out and I, I, I see them. And I pray that you would be with them, that you would be meeting them in their need, that they would sense uh, you close to them in this, that they would sense uh, the love that you have for them and how you are developing in them that beautiful, perfect faith through these difficult, difficult moments. Give all of us who surround God wisdom and how we can best uh, minister to our spiritual community and teach us your ways, God, because we desperately seek to walk in them. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.